This is an optional video where we're going to talk about the idea of the specialty EQ. Fundamentally, it doesn't change our three primary functions of a mix EQ. Okay, we still have the fix it, the blend it, and the enhance it. And specifically with specialty or boutique EQ, we're talking in terms of enhancing it, but maybe in a slightly different way. So let's just go ahead and jump into it. Specialty EQ can be thought of as a more subtle form of enhance it, where the choice of EQ may be just as important as the settings that you put in. So the reason you're going to this specialty EQ is because you want to give a certain signal, give a certain audio track, an instrument, a voice, something different, something unique, something dare I say it, special. And this is where we come back to this idea of like, you know, the X factor of a mix, like what the pros are doing that you aren't. Is a specialty EQ going to fundamentally change a good or a bad mix? It absolutely isn't. But for a lot of people, this is that one or two additional percent that they seem to put, you know, 99% of their importance on. And it's really just not true at all. However, this is why this video is an optional video and it's still important and it still can add another dimension. But here, just choosing a particular EQ for its character, for its shapes, for its amplification, for its saturation, for whatever reason, is part of the thought process in going to one EQ versus another. Using a specialty EQ on every channel will turn it into a blended EQ and will probably minimize the effect that you're going for by having a specialty EQ. And this is really important because if you watch a demo of like a boutique EQ, so let's say it's a Poltec emulation like we're going to be using and that there are probably, I don't know, 10 or 15 different varieties out there. They'll show you in a demo video or they'll have presets where that EQ has been set for every single instrument you could think of. So they have like five different presets for vocals, 20 different presets for drums, things for guitar, things for bass. But if you were to use it in that fashion, what you're actually doing is using that EQ as a blended EQ and that specialty factor, that unique factor kind of goes out the window. And so you might be then missing the point. It's okay to use that Poltec in a blended context. Like it's fine to use it on every single channel if you want, but then it's no longer a specialty EQ because it's not for special case. It's more of the norm. And just remember that it's fine to use multiple EQs on a track as long as each serves a distinct purpose. And we come back to this time and time again here on this website, just the idea that you want to have a reason for using a processor and it's fine if you want to have three EQs, each serving a different role, a fix it role, an enhance it role, and a blend it role, if that's what the signal needs. Some things might only need a blend it. Something might be perfect, except that there's just rumble, in which case all it needs is a fix it. Totally okay. But again, since we're going to this idea of specialty EQ, you want to make sure it has a role. And it's even possible where you could have four EQs. Okay, so you could have a fix it EQ, you could have an enhance it EQ where you're tonally reshaping a sound, and then you could have another enhance it EQ where you're trying to do something special, and then you have the blend it. That might be uh, for like, let's say a really important lead vocal, that would be something you might consider doing. Okay, so just remember, as long as you have a reason for a processor, it's okay to put it on, but make sure each one serves a distinct and clear, concise purpose. Thinking practical. I know it's very hard to do that in the uh, audio world, especially when we get into the digital audio workstation where things are kind of freeform. But here's a question I'll just ask you. How many Pultec, or more likely how many Pultec clones or massive passives, which is uh, the EQ you see here on the bottom. I'm sorry, this is blurry. This is all I could use for Creative Commons reasons. But on the bottom here is a massive passive. It's more of a mastering EQ, very expensive along with a Pultec. But how many of these EQs are you going to have in a high end recording studio, more likely you might have one, which would be a Pultec clone. But if you're really lucky, you might have both a Pultec and a massive passive. Okay, but you're not going to have six of them. You're not going to have 10 of them. 
You know, you're going to have one. In the computer, we can have an unlimited number, but that doesn't mean we should exploit that just for the sake of it. So again, a special TEQ loses its special value the more you use it, okay? If it's on every single track, it's just the norm. It's not really doing anything special. It's not serving a special purpose. Like if you just have one Poltec in the studio, you have to make sure that you put it on the signal that, you know, you want to really exemplify or that you want to make special. I'm going to use that word a lot of times just because I'm trying to to, you know, get that concept to really drive home to you. It's okay to be greedy though. You know, if you spend $200 on something and you can have as many instances as you want, you do might, you might want to use it more than once on a mix and that's totally okay. So it's fine to imagine you have three stereo Poltex, which would actually be six Poltex, but not like 10 or 15. At that point, it's no longer special. It just becomes the norm and again, might defeat the purpose. And since this video is about specialty EQ, it would defeat the purpose. Purpose. Specialty EQs themselves, the actual products, compared to compressors, there are relatively few specialty or boutique EQs that have stood the test of time, that continue to be talked about and that continue to have emulations made of them. The most famous example and really the only example I can think of off the top of my head in a mixing environment is the Poltec, okay? When you see racks of gear, how often do you see like individual EQs? They're almost all Poltecs or Poltec clones. There are a few exceptions out there, but for the most part, it's the same general idea. And the reason being, you know, in, in, a, in a realistic, in a practical setting, if you're actually at the console, you need, uh, you know, your utility EQ on every single channel. And just based on the design of the Poltec, it's impossible to fit that on every single channel, not to mention it would be ridiculously expensive and just inefficient and would probably overheat the entire uh, system there. So if you actually ever work with a real Poltec, the thing gets incredibly hot. Uh, the parts break all the time, but it has a really special character and special quality, and that's why it keeps getting used again and again and again on virtually every professional mix. There'll be some kind of Poltec, Poltec clone, Poltec emulation. Graphic EQs are kind of an exception here. So graphic EQs are the ones that just have a bunch of sliders. You probably have one uh, in it maybe in your basement right now if you have like a record player or record machine. Uh, these are more designed and used to like fix room modes. They can be used in mixing, but the ones where you have like 30 or 40 different bands, uh, very difficult to actually use in practice in a mix. And we're not even going to talk about graphic EQs in this course because we don't have access to any, or at least I'm not making any available here for this uh, freeware class. Many EQ emulations are console-based. Okay, another big point here, not specialty EQs. And as you'll see, they can be used as specialty EQs, but for the most part, if you have an SSL console, everything is running through that. Every single channel may have that EQ on it, and it's no longer specialty. It's a blended EQ, but a lot of time and effort has been put into making emulations of these famous uh, console EQs, but they're different from specialty EQs depending on their use and their purpose that they serve in the mix, and that's where this whole idea of specialty blurs, as you'll find out uh, as we go a little bit further in this presentation. Specialty software, okay, so the actual plugins. Digital has, and I hate to use this expression, but it's really true, has changed the game in a few ways. So first of all, it's very easy to mix and match because there are so many emulations out there. If you want to process your vocals using uh, a Neve uh, channel strip, you can do that. And then if you want to process the drums using an SSL channel strip, you could do that. And you can throw a Poltec on something else. You can mix and match and you can do these combinations that just were never possible to do in the past. There's no limit to the number of instances. And that goes back to what we said before. You could have 20 Poltex on everything if you wanted to. And also with digital specifically, there have been and there continue to be new designs and algorithms. Just think about the TDR uh, Slick EQ, okay? That's very unique to digital for the way that it operates and the idea behind it. And not only that, but we have this idea, at least in digital, of a linear phase, something that just can't be done in analog. You have these really hyper clean, really realistic sounding EQs. You have things that don't give any kind of distortion at all, which you're not really going to find as much in the analog world. So with digital, it's brought about this whole 
whole new world and way of thinking about using EQ and specifically how you think about specialty EQ. So in the past, if you're mixing a rock and roll album and it's going through an SSL uh, console, everything is being EQ'd on that SSL with the exact same components. You know, it's the same thing, channel to channel to channel, unless something's broken. And then you have that pull tech that gets used for something really important. Okay, and that's just how it would work. In the computer, it's not like that at all. It could be the pull tech that is on every single channel, and then you throw one SSL EQ onto, again, something important like the drums or the guitar. So this idea of digital going into the computer has changed the way we think about specialty uh, if you want to change it. It's fine to actually hearken to the past, and if you want to make things that sound, uh, have the character of what was done in the past, you want to think about it from that perspective, but you absolutely don't have to. What makes it special? Why is this considered a specialty EQ? And I wrote here, you know, the same ideas of what we've seen before. Shape, amplification, you know, is there saturation, distortion being brought in? And then also it's practical use, which comes back to it's only special if it's not used a lot, if it's rare, if it's unique, if it only is on one or two instruments. That ultimately is what makes it special. Otherwise, it's just like all the other EQs, you know, it comes down to the shape, comes down to the amplification, how the thing is boosting or cutting, and then what purpose the EQ is actually going to serve. So in a modern design, especially of these high-end sort of analog EQs, almost all of them are designed for mastering purposes. Okay, and we're not even going to talk about the mastering process in this course, but if you imagine after the mix stage, there's one final stage, that's what the mastering stage is, and that's where you see like these EQs specifically made for that reason, or which we're going to get to in a second, this idea of like the 500 rack series of making the EQ that you would find for 64 channels on a console, making just one of those available for you to have access to. In context, look at this image, tell me is this special? It's an API console, 64 channels, exactly the same modules going all the way across. And the answer is on a mix, this EQ is not special. It's a special mix because it's run through an API console, but that's for the cohesion factor. That's for everything going through the exact same processors. That's what's giving it its character, but the EQ itself is not very special. However, if we look at this lunchbox design, and you can see that there are two um, API EQs right here, I think these are 550Bs, this now becomes special. You don't have a million of them. You have a pair, so this could be used on something that's stereo or something that's mono. Okay, same idea with, I guess this is an E27. Not 100% sure, it doesn't matter, but all of these would be considered specialty EQs. And this is how digital has really changed the game in such a uh, massive way, which is why we come into the modern world, the 500 series. Here you see it blown up, one of these API lunchboxes. And uh, again, the image is very blurry, but it's the best I could do. Uh, the 500 series, these like rack size modules has really changed, I think, the way that you know, the new producer, the new mix engineer is looking at and approaching mixing. And I want to stress that there's a new school way of looking at it. And there's an old school way of looking at it. One is not better than the other, but it would be wrong of me to tell you that the way you should approach every mix is to pick one EQ, you know, and then just have one specialty. That's just not right. Because if you look here, there's a variety of EQs here. Each one of these could be considered a specialty EQ. And then you have in the DAW, you specifically then have your blended EQ that's playing the role of this, okay, of the console. So things have changed so much. We've taken blend EQs, channel strip EQs, and converted them to specialty based on their use. If they only appear on one thing, they've become very special then and distinct. Uh, distinct, sorry. Uh, this allows for anyone to easily bridge the software and hardware world. And this is why if you're a new mix engineer and you want some different flavors, this is the way that you go about doing it. You get one of these lunch boxes, you get one of these 500 series racks and a bunch of companies make things that you can put into them. It's a lot like the modular synthesizers, only in my opinion, a lot more practical and easy to wrap your head around. That being said, 
even one of these modules is way outside of my price range and I probably wouldn't use it that much. So I don't own any of these because I don't think that it's really worth it. But for a lot of people, it definitely is. It gives you the spirit of analog, the spirit of a specialty EQ, and then you can always go to the DAW for your blend it. So the conclusion here is that there are no defined rules about what is and isn't specialty anymore. In the past, the only specialty EQ that at least I could think of would be something like a Pultec. Okay, that was the specialty one and everything else was just channel strip. Okay, it was the EQ that was built into a console. Now, however, with emulations, we can start to mix and match and we can change the rules and blend the ideas about what is and isn't specialty. So it all comes down to context, what you're using in the mix on the, on the large scale, and the application. So that's what I want you to get away from this. There aren't specific specialty EQs anymore. Everything could be considered specialty if it's only used one or two times. That being said, from a cohesion standpoint, bringing the mix together, there will be some form of a blended EQ that you want to have consistently. And that can just be even your DAW's built-in EQ. That's totally fine. And honestly, that's the way that I approach it. It's not necessarily the right way. It's not the wrong way, but it's just how I tend to look at it and think about things. So for this course, I'd say it's pretty obvious that our specialty EQ, the one that we have access to here, is the PTEQX. So this is a Pultec emulation with an X on the end, I'm guessing for extreme. Sorry, bad joke, I don't really know. But this would be the obvious go-to one because this is the one that we've seen in the past. That being said, we could also use the TDR Slick EQ in a dual purpose here, we could use a different setting. So instead of just working with American or British as our blended EQ, we could go to the Soviet design, choose a different output stage, a different saturation stage, and really pump the saturation in. And now the TDR Slick EQ is being used as a specialty as well. So you can have more than one specialty EQ. And that's the way that I think a lot of modern mix engineers now look at their toolbox. They say, okay, if I want to use the Neve here, I can do that. If I want to use the SSL here, I can do that. If I want a pull tech here, I can do that. But at the end, I'm going to want something that's going to bring it all together. And in our situation, we're kind of required to use EQ as that mechanism. There are other things you can use that we'll look at in other courses. But for now, let's just keep it simple. Think about EQ and think about the purpose and role that it's going to define. Up next, we're going to jump into the DAW and just do one really basic and simple example of how we might use a specialty EQ. Shouldn't be anything that you don't know already, but I know having the uh, practical example can help a lot of people. Okay, so we're back here for the example, and we just have this very basic kick drum. It comes from the 100 drum samples pack. And what I want to imagine is, you know, we're deciding that this element is really critical. It's really important to the mix. And so we want to use a specialty EQ on it. And what that would require is then going into our EQ choices here in our mix tools, or it could even be in our regular effects, and picking something that we haven't really used a lot of, okay? The thing that's going to be unique, we're not going to pull to it a million times. So in this example, we'll grab the PTEQX. I'm going to do another example using the Slick EQ just to uh, make this a lot clearer. And let's look at this plugin because it's kind of complicated in the way it works. You have these three different modules, all of which you can turn on or off. And here we have actually filters. And normally with this particular device, you don't always see the filters emulated. So that's really, really cool. This is clearly a Pultec style EQ. So if you've worked with the original, you can try to make those connections it's not going to sound that similar to the original. You'll hear differences, but not necessarily one's better than the other. We have this routing option of stereo or mono. Since this is a mono signal, I believe, let's take a look and double check it. Since this is a mono signal, let's put it into mono just so that we can really um, you know, emphasize or, or get the most out of this without pumping out the CPU. Just try to be efficient there. And then we have an oversampling option. Since I'm working at 44.1, I think I'm just going to leave the oversampling to off. I can experiment with it at two times, see if it sounds any better. But what we're really looking to do here is use this as a specialty EQ. And so what makes this kind of more special than most is that we have this output amplifier gain stage, which in this case is a tube. And tubes emphasize even ordered harmonics. Doesn't matter that's not important, but the tube is kind of the characteristic that really makes this so famous, that and the shape of the curves. So it actually 
uh, both the shape and then the amplification stage. And here you can actually choose between a bunch of different tubes. I'm not sure if these numbers correspond to the year or if they actually correspond to just different tube models. Not important. You can go through, listen to each one, and see if you prefer one or the other. But the only way that you're actually going to hear really any kind of saturation or additional character is how you use and handle this gain stage. So if you are keeping this within the bounds of the tube amplifier circuit, you're not actually going to get any distortion. You're going to have to like overdrive it here using the input and the output. And that's really important because people will be like, I don't feel like I'm hearing anything added when I drop this EQ on. And yeah, you won't unless you actually try to overdrive the circuit. And you can do that very easily just by like adding a lot of gain. So let's just enhance this sound a little bit. We're doing the enhance it here with the specialty EQ. And for those of you who are beginners, why don't we go and put on a spectrum analyzer here just to uh, make our lives a little bit easier and to think about how we want to handle this. So I'll put one before for now, and then we'll put one after, um, just so we can see the before and after. So let's take a look at this signal. Okay. Cool. All right, so what I think I want to do, I think I'm going to try to enhance the transient. So that looks like it's around 112. I might filter off a little bit down here. Not sure how important that is. I'm probably going to turn the volume on my headphones up so I can really hear it. Um, and then I might actually then also add some kind of a boost up in this region up here and try to emphasize that click a little bit more and make sure that this is going to pop through really good on small speakers. So let's go in there and do that. And right here I have a boost option at 200. Is that going to work for me or can I pick something a little bit closer? Okay, I could pick something that's 100. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and turn this one on first. I'm going to turn the tube off for now. And let's just go ahead and add a little bit of boost, make sure we can hear it. Whoa. Okay, I thought that the EQ was really coloring it, but that was just because I turned it up. So even for me, you know, I get tricked by the loudness thing all the time. All right, so let's go ahead and add some boost here. Okay, so I'm actually liking the boost at 45. I never would have thought that would be where I'd want the boost at, but hey, there it is. Let's see what happens if we put this low cut up to 50. Now, the unique thing about these filters is that they have a very broad slope. So typically, even though we have 45 when we're adding a boost, it's okay to put the low cut on. Let's see how that works. And we are clipping a little bit, so just bring that down. Let's try bypassing everything. Yeah, you know what? I'm not really the biggest fan of the filter in this case because I really like boosting around 45. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to bring in another EQ that's going to work as my fix it. Okay, so we'll go to our mix tools, we'll grab the TDR Nova, uh, and let's just use a filter on this guy. Okay, I'm liking that a little bit more. And now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put a little dip, and this is the common way that this is used. I'm gonna put a, actually, you know, I should probably even sharpen this up a little bit. But it, what happens in this EQ is that after the boost of 45, if you put an immediate dip after that, it's gonna emphasize what we've done even more. So I'm gonna actually use a little bit of this attenuation. Let's do an extreme first. So I'm just trying to focus that transient, that fundamental. So this should have cleared things up a little bit. Yep. You can hear how much more precise that is, how clean it is. I know it's getting quieter, but it's also having that same effect. And then what I might do is go and, I don't know, let's pick a high frequency and just hear if there's a boost that we like. Okay, so that's that area.
I'm always a big sucker for 5K, but I think in this case, I'm going to go with 4K. Let's make it kind of extreme. It actually sounds better that way. And probably one of the reasons is because there's not that much going down there anyway or going on at that point. So by putting in more, it's actually a way that we can hear it. So, okay, so let's try no EQ. A little bit muddy. Not so clear. A lot more clarity. We've really kind of tightened it up a little bit. And let's just look at our spectrum analyzer. And again, if you think it sounds like 20 times worse, that's fine. This is again, a taste thing. All right, so this is what we have as the after. I've never tried to uh, have both open at the same time. Oh, seems to work. And this is the before. Okay, so really look at what's happening in this region around here. Okay, and even kind of to an extent what's going on there. And you can see the way that we've smoothed this all out ever so slightly. Okay, so not the biggest difference in the world, but still something is going on there and we can definitely hear what's happening. Now, if we want, we can try to add in that additional character by bringing in the tube component of this. And each of these tubes is different. And again, we're gonna try to like overdrive it to make sure that we can actually hear it. And uh, let's just go ahead and mess around with that. And again, this is a, a personal taste thing. The other thing I'll point out is that we haven't even had to use this top mid-range one. And in this case, I don't really think it, it, it's needed. And I don't think we need to use the filters either here. So we're just using this one in the middle and you know, I'm happy with the results we got. Let's overdrive it in now. So this is an extreme. But that's fine. Extreme will at least let us hear it. Okay, let's try the different modes. I'm liking the pound on that one. That one seems to take away clarity. So for me, it's between 88 and 82. Sorry. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And there we've also then kind of level matched. All right, so I'm going to go with this. And, you know, even this overdrive, I like the way this sounds. You know, this seems like it might be a little bit extreme, but quite frankly, I'm happy with it. Uh, I, I really like that sound quite a bit by using this EQ. And again, my purpose for going with the specialty EQ here was really more than anything else just to make this stand out that much more. And I'd probably still want a blend EQ with probably very subtle settings just to then kind of bring it back into the fold. So let's get rid of the PTEQX and instead let's bring on the uh, TDR Voss Slick EQ, okay? So this could serve two purposes. This could be a blend EQ, it could be an enhanced EQ, uh, or it could be a specialty enhanced EQ, and that's how we're gonna use it. So let's imagine that the normal default for this in the blended stage is on something like Silky, which I like, and um, the output stage here, this is supposed to be like a console EQ, so everything in here is transformers. Transformers will emphasize both even and odd-ordered harmonics, so you wanna be a little bit careful with what you do here. Uh, but I like the Silky stage, and it seems like they've actually made their own characteristics that they think sound good, which I'm all in favor of. So let's go with Silky. The harder you calibrate this, the more you're gonna get, okay? So for now, I'm gonna put it down to zero and we'll do the same thing we did before. We'll drive it in there. So this is different than having an input and an output gain stage. And actually, I think it's very intuitive, especially for people who don't understand how like overdriving an amplifier works. So this is more for the everyday user. You can just drive it in from here without actually needing to worry about input and output gain. So let's say that this is our normal setting for the blended EQ. To make this a specialty EQ, I'm gonna go to something different. So so maybe we could go with German, okay? Now German's typically a very kind of clean sounding one, 
But you know, since it's not something that we normally use, it can work as our specialty. So I'll turn the saturation on even though it's not working and I'm gonna go do something different. So let's try the deep stage, okay? And we're definitely gonna drive it in here so that we can hear it. So now this has become my specialty EQ and we're gonna kind of do the same sort of thing. So uh, let's just jump into it. Maybe I don't need the Nova for the filter. Let's try this actual filter in here. Cool, and now we can either use a shelf or a bell. Why don't we just go ahead and try to use a shelf? Ah, I don't like that frequency. Okay, I'm more a fan of that. Let's just go ahead and compensate. And we're gonna do similar to what we did before. We're gonna go ahead and put some cut in here. Make it extreme first. Actually, an extreme setting sounds pretty good. You can hear just how much it cleans up that area right there. And you gotta remember too that my background is more so in, you know, pop style music. So I prefer cleaning up those areas just because of like a clarity thing. That's just what, how my brain works and how my ear works. For you, again, it might be totally different. It would be fine to have the inverse settings here if it's serving your purpose. I wanna really drive that home that my aesthetic choices do not have to match and mirror yours. No, definitely the high shelf there. Okay, so we can take the whole thing out and in. And then again, let's go ahead and change it to mono just so that we are actually, um, you know, being as efficient as possible here. And the last thing I'm going to do is I'm going to add in a little bit of this uh, additional saturation. So again, like we did before, we can push it really hard if we want, or we can make it subtle. Let's push it really hard so that we emphasize the specialty part here. So we can go through the different models. It's not having as big as a difference as I'd want it to. Let's just turn the volume up here. We can also actually just have more gain coming in from the start. So with this one, the saturation is a little bit harder to hear than it was with the tube. But if you have a lot more critical ear than I have, you're probably hearing bigger differences. I'm honestly not hearing the biggest of differences in the world. You can really hear the funky. You can kind of hear the deep. The other ones, it's a lot harder. And I think that has to do with this being more of a blended EQ in general, where you're really just trying to add that little bit of cohesion, something more that you may be going to sense with a lot of instances versus really trying to overdrive this thing. Or maybe I just don't have the most critical ear in the world. So uh, this is what I think I'm going to go with.
You know, I don't really like the sound of that. Maybe this would actually be a little bit more in my liking, or I might just not put saturation on at all. Okay. I think that's what we'll go with. So one final time, let's do the before and after. So that's the idea with specialty EQ. I know this was a very lengthy video, but that's also why it's an optional video. Uh, anyway, I hope that you've maybe learned something new and you now are starting to understand the reason for having a lot of these boutique sort of plugins. It's not going to change your mix. It's not going to change your life. It's not going to suddenly take you from an amateur to an experienced professional. But what it will do is give you another set of tools for enhancing um, your particular parts here and actually maybe trying to make some a little bit more special than others. That's really what it's all about. Thanks for your attention and uh, I hope you've learned something new.